Art can be created in many forms. From paintings to literature, cinema, and music, every artist has to invent their own style and techniques to push the boundary and create their own unique form of self-expression. Whether it be like Vincent van Gogh, whose unique approach to color and texture in paintings cemented him as one of the greatest painters to ever live, or like Georges Méliès, whose impressive technical achievements opened the doors for generations of artists to express themselves in a different art form, to make a great piece of art, one has to try new things and truly make it your own. And few, if any, have made their art as personal and experimental as Lithuanian artist Janus Mekas. But to really understand Mekas and his art, it's important that we talk about his life. Born on December 24th, 1922, Mekis grew up in Semeniške, a small Lithuanian village of about 20 families near the border of Latvia. Not a lot is known about his very early years, but he was friends with actor Donatas Banyonis, someone who would eventually reach fame by acting in Tarkovsky's Solaris. Janus received his first ever camera as a birthday present, and as he spotted Soviet tanks rolling through nearby his home, he took his first ever picture. The picture wouldn't survive though, as a Russian soldier spotted him and destroyed the film. Now, Mekis' activities between 1939 and 1944 are discussed and argued about by a lot of historians, and I will try my best to summarize the facts, the history, and its effects, but if anyone has anything to add, please feel free to do so. In 1939, the Soviet Union was already present in Lithuania, and the local population had begun to feel the negative effects of the occupation. During this time, an 18-year-old Mekis began editing and publishing two underground right-wing ultranationalist newspapers that called for the expulsion of the Soviet Union off of Lithuanian land and looked at Nazi Germany as a means of doing so. At this time in the war, there were two main attitudes Lithuanians had toward the Nazi party, some of them looking at it as a salvation of the Soviet occupation, and some of them openly supporting and believing in Nazi ideology. While the newspapers that Janus Mekis edited and published in were certainly anti-Semitic in nature, there isn't a single example of anti-Semitism in Mekis's personal publications, leading most historians to believe that he was the former of those two beliefs. Janus instead opted to write about preventing alcohol abuse, poetry, drawing sketches, and even wrote a tribute to leftist poet Kazis Binkis. One of his first poems, a satire that compared Stalin to Don Quixote, got him in trouble with the Soviet government. In 1944, a time in which Mekis had to hide and write his poems and essays in secret, a Nazi officer discovered his hidden typewriter, and fearing that it would trace back to his family, Jonas and his brother Adolphus fled Lithuania with the plans of arriving in Switzerland, where their uncle would be waiting for them with fake documents identifying them as students. Jonas would later find out that they were right in leaving, as the soldier did manage to track down his parents' home, and after refusing to give them up, killed all of the animals on their farm. Obviously, there is so much more to the history and climate of the time that can't be fit into this video, but how much responsibility Mecca shares in Lithuanians' changing attitudes toward the Nazi party, as well as how aware he was of the Nazis' intents at the time of publishing the papers, is still something that is being debated over to this day. I've included two essays, one criticizing him and one defending him, in the description down below, that I highly recommend you check out if you're interested in more of the details. On the way to Switzerland, the train was stopped by Nazi soldiers, and both him and his brother were imprisoned in a labor camp near Elmshorn, where they would spend the remaining months of the war. Once the war had ended, the brothers weren't able to return to Lithuania, due to the country still being occupied by the Soviet Union. He studied philosophy for two years in a nearby university while living in a displaced persons camp, and in 1949, after being rejected permission to move to Israel, New Zealand, and Canada, both he and Adolphus had found a job and an apartment in Chicago. However, after arriving and seeing New York City, the brothers decided to abandon the original plan and instead found a place to live in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Just a few days after settling in, he borrowed some money to buy himself his first cinema camera, a Bolex 16mm film camera. Inspired by the avant-garde films shown in cheap local cinemas, Mekis began to film his own life and experiences, as well as host his own film festivals to show other experimental films. 
Between 1954 and 1964, Jonas Mekas would continue showing avant-garde films as well as publishing movie journals and articles, eventually being one of the founders of Anthology Film Archives, one of the largest and most important libraries of experimental cinema. His contribution to the New American Cinema Movement got him his nickname of the Godfather of the Avant-Garde, as well as allowed him to collaborate with other important artists of the time, such as Allen Ginsberg, Andy Warhol, Yoko Ono, and John Lennon. It was also in 1964 that Mekas was arrested on obscenity charges for showing the film Un Chant d'Amour at a film festival, a film that was banned in the USA for its homosexual content. It wasn't anything surprising though, as Mekas had launched an anti-censorship protest in defense of LGBTQ films that were banned in America at the time. Jonas Mekas would release his first film, Guns of the Trees, in 1962. Shot in black and white, the story follows two timelines, one where a man and a married couple from church try to convince a young woman not to commit suicide, and the other timeline following after she's committed suicide and them trying to understand why she did it. The name of the film comes from a Stuart Perkoff poem that details young people of a society that is so against them that it feels like nature itself is pointing firearms at them. The film was generally well received by the avant-garde crowd, but after this, Giannis would stop making narrative films and focus more on his video diary films, arguably what he is most known for today. His first of these works, Walden, named after Henry David Thoreau's memoir of the same name, was released in 1968. The film was composed of home video footage shot over the previous four years, edited together with music, title cards, and Mekas' poetic narration. The footage would consist of normal moments in Mekas' daily life, as well as other events like weddings or simple hangouts with friends culminating in a very personal and warm experience reflecting on the simple pleasures of life. Due to the extremely low budget, the film would often switch between color film and black and white film when Mekas was running low on funding. His camera work is also very different from other home videos taken, opting instead for an unstable and erratic camera than a calm and straight shot. This way of making films stuck with Mekas for the rest of his life, and I think his attitude toward this style is summarized by his quote, we need less perfect, but more free films. In the early 70s, as the editor for the Film Culture magazine, Janusz Mekis was invited to attend the Moscow Film Festival. Upon arriving, he read an edition of Pravda, or in English, Truth, and realized he had met its cultural editor, Yuri Zhukov, a few years prior at an event in New York. For those unaware, Pravda was a popular newspaper owned by the Communist Party that served as a way of disseminating propaganda and opinions down to every member of society. So this editor was a very influential person when it came to Soviet politics. Mekas made the request that he and his brother meet with Zhukov to his hosts, and after a quick tea, realized that his hosts had become a bit confused about who he was. Using this confusion to his advantage, he had them arrange a trip for the both of them to Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, and from there, the brothers were finally able to visit their parents in their hometown of Semenishke, after 27 years abroad, which is where Jonas would get the footage to make his film Reminiscences of a Journey to Lithuania. I don't want to speak too much on the film itself, as it would take the first viewing experience away from you, but to me, it is easily the most personal, emotional, and rewatchable of all of his films. After the trip, he edited the film in around 48 hours and sent it off to East Germany, where the film was scheduled to premiere on television. The film was a massive success and continued to be shown on German television every few months by audience demand. By the end of that year, he was visited by his old friend and now famous actor Donatas Banyones, accompanied by the head of the Soviet film expert Serebreko, who both requested to watch the film in a cinema. Upon finishing the film, Serebrekov reportedly became furious that the film was nothing but his mother cooking for him and didn't mention anything about the progress of the Soviet Union. Mekas responded simply, This is not about the Soviet Union. I came back here to film my memories. Serebrekov and Banyones, who loved the film, almost fought with each other over their conflicting opinions, with Serebrekov demanding the film be destroyed. The film, of course, was not destroyed, and now stands as one of the most significant works documenting the time and emotions that resonate with so many people to this day. I won't go through all of his work, because he has over 120 films to his name, but I did want to briefly mention some other significant works of his. The films Lost, 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 and He Stands in the Desert Counting the Seconds of His Life are also similarly structured to Walden, 
but focus on later life experiences of his. In the year 2000, he premiered the film that's widely considered to be his magnum opus. As I was moving ahead, briefly I saw glimpses of beauty. A four and a half hour long video diary documenting his personal life over the previous 30 years, including real footage of significant life events, like his daughter's first ever steps. Notes on an American film director at work is a documentary he made about Martin Scorsese filmed on the set of the 2006 film The Departed, which is also a very interesting watch. In 2007, he hosted a project on his website called the 365 Day Project in which he released a short film every single day for free online. Outside of film, he also published his personal journals, worked on poetry, and also opened a visual arts center in Vilnius. And on January 23rd, 2019, Giannis Mekis passed away in his home in New York at the age of 96. I'm not totally sure how to end this essay. Someone who's lived so much and created as much as he did can't be summarized so easily in a few sentences. So I'm going to leave you with a description that Jonas Mekis himself wrote for his final major work, the 2012 film Outtakes from the Life of a Happy Man. A motion picture composed of brief diaristic scenes not used in completed films from the years 1960 to 2000, and self-referential video footage taped during the editing. Brief glimpses of family, friends, girlfriends, the city, seasons of the year, travels. Occasionally I talk, reminisce, or play music I taped during those earlier years, plus more recent piano improvisations by August Varkalis. It's a kind of autobiographical diaristic poem, a celebration of happiness and life. I consider myself a happy man, 